So I'd like to uh, introduce our panel today. Uh, we have a selection of sanitation experts that will be discussing their projects with uh, some of the members of the Stockholm Environment Institute team. Uh, we've been actually been engaged by the Gates Foundation to look at some of these projects that um, have been ongoing for the last few years. We have um, four uh, uh, connected on, on the uh, cameras today. I can't see. Uh, the first one is Tony Sanchez from uh, the University of Barcelona. The second one is uh, Jenny Wang from uh, Frontier Environmental Ecology, Missouri. The uh, third is Tomezgan Roma at San Diego State University in California. Um, and the uh, last one we have today is Gabrielle McGill, uh, all the way from Phnom Penh. We live and learn uh, environmental education. Um, my name is Arno Rosemarin at PCI. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Elizabeth von Munk from Stella Consulting. And we have two team partners from SCI, that's uh, Nelson Atani and Kim Anderson. Um, so we will be uh, allowing each of the, the four pre presenters uh, to, to show their, their work. We, will, we have a little bit of a PowerPoint for some of them. Uh, the first one uh, will be uh, Tony Sanchez from the University of Barcelona. He will be talking about uh, his project. I, I can just mention that all of these are dealing with biogas type systems. Uh, that subject and different kinds of applications. Um, so we, he will be talking about the increase of biogas production using uh, low cost nano particles and uh, production of sanitized compost from digested materials. Um, I will then uh, show his uh, slides here if we can just move into that. Um, there we have it. And we'll make the screen just a little bit bigger for you. You can, you can turn this slide. It's only the time. So. so, Tony Sanchez, away you go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you much for inviting me to be here. And I would like to present this project with some slow presentation, low presentation with some results. So our project comes from a, you know, surprising thing that we were studying the toxicity of nanoparticles on several wastewater microbial communities. And we test uh, natrifying communities and especially anaerobic communities. And we have uh, tested uh, several inorganic nanoparticles such as titanium, cerium, etc. And the surprise comes with uh, iron oxide nanoparticles because we see that in discontinuous, in batch experiments, we have uh, abnormal uh, production of biogas when the communities uh, of uh, methanogenesis were in contact with these nanoparticles. So if you can turn the slide, you will see on your left, this is the production of the control and gold nanoparticles. Gold nanoparticles are known because they are inert, so they don't have any, any problems. In the, in the right side, you will see the thing that happens when you use iron oxide nanoparticles. Uh, you will see the control, the gold nanoparticles, and in some times, about between 10, 15 days, you have a, a very increase of nanoparticles when using iron oxide nanoparticles. This is uh, the first uh, background that we have when we try to reproduce these results on, on pilot scale, because these are batch tests in about half a liter, more or less, volume. So in the next slide, you will see that 
our TEM images, when you will see the nanoparticles are on the surface of the bacterium, of the methanogenic bacterium. So we are not sure if the nanoparticles are inside or outside the cell, but you don't see the free nanoparticles. All the nanoparticles are on the surface. So this is batch test. So our uh, goal is to try to reproduce this in continuous experiments, in full-scale experiments. So this is the, the aim of, of the process. So we started to, to try small reactors in continuous mode. These are truly the reactor to make controls, to test different concentrations of nanoparticles, etc. And we built another bioreactor in the next, next slide, please. This is a 100 liter bioreactor with all the complete monitoring, etc. And this is at South in a place uh, just near the university, near the labs. So in this case, uh, we found that uh, in continuous process, we were not able to reproduce the big increase of the biogas produced. Uh, let, me, let me tell you that biogas is produced, but in case of methane, even the concentration of methane with using nanoparticles was higher, is about 70%, more or less. So uh, one of the things that we, that we imagine is that the nanoparticles that, that, is made, that are made of iron, iron is an essential element for, for bacteria, so it's you have uh, some kind of release of free iron that is the, case, the cause of producing more biogas. But we are not sure. So our last results that are the most interesting, this is the next slide, that I put it in the forum, is the, is the following. So you will see here uh, four continuous reactors. These reactors are fitted. If you see R except R2, the other ones are with nano, without nanoparticles, only with wastewater sludge as fit. So in this case, you will see the normal evolution. The evolution is that you produce biogas. The production ends sometimes when the easily biodegradable organic matter it is exhausted, so it is normal. But in the case of nanoparticles, when you stop feeding, there is some kind of a starving condition that nanoparticles produce, they gain the abnormal producing of biogas in an extent that can be probably double that you have when you, when you are not using nanoparticles. So we are not working in a strategy that permits to, to choose uh, how to feed an anaerobic digester in a continuous mode using nanoparticles and to recover all the possible biogas. In this case, if you produce more, bio, more biogas, the, the final product, the digested material, it's uh, for sure to be a more stabilized material. It's probably similar to compost, but we have made some respiration tests with compost, and it's a compost that can be used in, for land, for instance. So we have both, both benefits, more biogas and more stabilized material, but we still have to uh, define how to feed a continuous process, especially at pilot and at full scale. We have several contacts with uh, full scale uh, wastewater treatment plants with anaerobic digestion to try to test this in a, you know, uh, 1,000 cubic meter digester. So it's more or less our, our situation now.
okay so I think that's the last uh, slide on your um, on your presentation but is there any questions from the group here I, I found it rather interesting that you said that you had a 70% increase in gas production you can see it in the slide here uh, because of iron but isn't there something else in the in the particle as well it's uh, is it nitrate no, or phosphate no uh, but, um, there is no. another thing that I have not mentioned, but it's very important. Uh, that this is not, not uh, commercial nanoparticles. With commercial nanoparticles, we have seen a lot of problems of agglomeration, and they are not active. We have to produce the nanoparticles and stabilize the nanoparticles. So. Uh, we have tested several stabilizers for nanoparticles and we have several good candidates that produce this increase but other ones that doesn't produce anything. And we have always controls. So if you have some nitrate, phosphate, something like this, we will be uh, the same in the control but we haven't seen that. It's only when we have nanoparticles and the, the sludge, the biomass, the thick biomass, uh, lost the biodegradable organic matter. Because if you have in a continuous process a uh, daily feed, you are all, always uh, giving uh, more easily biodegradable organic matter. So we suspect that iron nanoparticles helps in consuming some substrate that in normal condition is not biodegradable. It's probably some fat, some fiber, some kind of things. But we are now studying, according to the, our, our opinion in the, in the forum, uh, the enzymatic activities when using nanoparticles, because there are evidence that some uh, cellulases, proteases, lipases are activated in the presence of iron. So we are now in, in this moment. Great. Um, I think Elizabeth yeah, has I, a question. Yeah, I raised my hand. <laughs> uh, thanks very much for that, Tony. Mm -hmm. And I also want to thank you for your active participation on the forum. It's been really nice to see the exchanges that you've had there. Um, I'm just wondering um, which developing country um, context do you envisage for this? Um, the cost could be maybe prohibitive. I don't know how much it would cost in a continuous process to add these nanoparticles no. all the time. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the question is crucial. So if you are producing more biogas, but the nanoparticles are more expensive, you don't gain any thing. But in our case, uh, iron nanoparticles are very cheap. So you can buy iron at very low cost price. The problem is that if you use it at a lab scale, it's expensive, as everything in lab is expensive. But you can build, well, you can buy a lot of tomes of uh, iron to produce iron oxide nanoparticles and because it's very low. So I don't think that it is a problem. The problem is to reproduce these results and these results not only with wastewater sludge. Try, for instance, municipal solid waste, uh, manures, other wastes that are every, everywhere in the world. Okay, I think um, we're going to move to the next speaker, and that will be uh, Chen Ming Wang from uh, the Frontier Environmental Technology Organization in Missouri, U.S. And I'll just put up his um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Chen Ming uh, Wang from the Frontier Environmental Technology Organization in. Missouri, USA. Uh, they have partners in Madagascar and Kenya for this biogas uh, project. 
Uh, the title of the paper is Biogas Generator Powered by Self-Sustaining Mixing Mechanisms. In order to be, provide fuel for daily cooking, biogas reduce the waste discharge and to improve hygiene. So you have the floor, um, Janmin. Okay, thank you, Arno. Uh, thank you for uh, this opportunity. Uh, Elizabeth, you did a really good job in uh, putting all these things together and all this discussion. Uh, initially, I was not involved very much, but with a uh, uh, couple of emails from Elizabeth, I, I start uh, put the time in. And I, actually, I just came back from China um, uh, two days ago, so I, I, that's why I did not prepare, did not get the time to prepare a slide yet. Uh, the motivation of this project is uh, two years ago when I had my sabbatical uh, in China, I read the uh, uh, news on the biogas generation process. Uh, China government uh, put a, a lot of effort to promote uh, any kind of uh, biogas generation technology to apply that uh, in, in, uh, in families. However, uh, even though uh, the government put, uh, I think, 50 to 80 percent match, match fund to build the reactor, but uh, less people are uh, interested. One reason is that um, based on the current technology, the, uh, it is slow, so the tank is large. And uh, in order to build the reactor, you have to use local material, brick, cement. Uh, and uh, uh, I think in one region, about 80% of biogas generator are not functional because of the gas leaking. So uh, at that time, I, I was thinking about, well, how to make it functional, easier, even though that's before I applied the, the project. But later on, I, uh, um, see this opportunity to apply this, this fund. And I further uh, kind of uh, uh, develop this technology. Well, we all know uh, to increase the uh, efficiency or reduce the size is to make a high rate biogas generator. And conventionally, in order to make a high rate biogas generator, we have to make, uh, put the mixing into the mixer. But that is not feasible for the people who are living in uh, developing countries. And the, the, maintenance is, uh, it, it, the maintenance will be huge. And, and it's difficult to, I mean, if you, you have that, you have to have electricity. Uh, but in many regions, you don't have, you don't have electricity. So uh, I was thinking about, well, how to make the reactor mix itself so that people don't need to put energy in, don't need to put the power, uh, I mean, the, the, the time in to maintain a high, high uh, rate bucket generator. This is the idea. And uh, I developed this idea to make it functional uh, by using a special structure that build inside the tank. So with this structure, um, the, uh, the 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 drawing uh, the sketch is in, in in the website already posted uh, in, in the discussion. So with other, uh, with this structure, uh, it will collect the biogas from the lower part of the reactor and accumulate in the middle in a gas tank. At some point, the gas amount is so large that it will leak into the central tubing, uh, the riser. Once it leaks into the riser, it will create a lift. And when it creates a lift, it will suck the entire amount of biogas collected in the middle of the tank into the riser. And by this time, it, it forms a big uh, air plug so that it will create a huge surge lift force to bring the sludge from the bottom to the top to have the reactor mixed. Uh, it is a totally maintenance-free structure. Uh, and uh, total, totally uh, energy-free. Uh, as I uh, learned from the large system, uh, actually uh, a huge amount of uh, energy um, harvested from biogas is used for mixing and used for heating. So, so if you get these two energy balanced, you are lucky. So probably you need more energy for a conventional biogas generator to operate then the energy you recovered. But with, uh, with this self-mixing uh, 
with this self-mixing mechanism, uh, then we do not need to use any external energy to uh, mix, the, mix the reactor. It also uh, makes the reactor hybrid so that um, we, uh, we can use smaller uh, tank size. Uh, the significance is if we can uh, have a smaller tank, then we can uh, fabricate all those tanks uh, in a central location in a factory and then deliver them into the household so that they can easily install those, those reactors without leaking. Um, we have uh, spent, uh, used the, uh, the foundation, foundation money um, to achieve the two things uh, during, the, uh, during the period. The first thing is we make the uh, original imagination um, re reality, which is we uh, tested using, using the air, of course, uh, and then uh, we found that the mixing works. Uh, and it, it works even stronger than I originally thought because originally I uh, built uh, glass reactors so that I can see inside. But after a while, the, all the glass uh, reactors are broken just because of the surge force push the, push the top of the reactor and shake the reactor. And, uh, and we have to build all steel reactor later on. Um, the, that's the first thing. Uh, I, I'm happy with that. The second thing is we preliminarily tested the uh, uh, functional performance in terms of the biogas production. So it, uh, based on the current data, we got 30% more biogas compared to a conventional non-mixed bioreactor. Um, this, is, uh, this is a good sign. It's not as good as what I thought, but it's, it's already giving a good sign. And by this, by this time, we ran out of money, so we did not do further experiment. But the, we already got this uh, um, concept proven. One thing uh, I hope to do is to build a larger reactor and a taller reactor. Right now, the reactor is only about five feet tall. Uh, so if we can build a taller reactor, then we have a high H over D ratio. That means that we can collect more biogas or make the mixing much better. This is, this is what I want to see uh, in the, the next phase. We apply for a uh, second phase, but we did not get the money, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, yeah, the th th this is the result. <laughs> uh, Farm-based uh, biogas reactors. Uh, those are the small ones. How, how, is, how is the retrofit going to work uh, for those? Ah, the, uh, uh, well, originally I, I meant to use this for a uh, household. Each, each family get one reactor, a family of four uh, get one reactor. Um, yeah, so so cubic, you, you just cubic, mentioned cubic, that, um, like that the um, current system is about less than four feet, right? That's what you see? Okay. Uh, if you got a smaller or um, shallower system, then you have to uh, use um, a pump, a small air pump, uh, biogas pump, to recycle the biogas to uh, drive the, the mixing. The, uh, the biogas pump actually, uh, for our first the test, we use the um, Bargas, we return the biogas to increase the mixing frequency. Uh, we have to do that. Uh, but as long as you can mix the, make the, the mixing like a once per hour, uh, I, I think that will be uh, good enough. So you do not need a lot of uh, um, power. The pump I used for, um, for my experiment was 8 watt, but we, we only turn on about 5 minutes per day. So. Uh, during that five minutes, it will make uh, several searches, several searches or several mixing. The, um, we know, well, actually theoretically for uh, anaerobic digestion process, uh, the mixing itself is, is not that critical because anaerobic process is already slow. The critical thing is to prevent sludge deposition at the bottom. So our system really did, just did that to uh, toss the sludge 
from the bottom to the top. Uh, that will uh, kind of uh, keep the uh, active volume uh, high, as high as, as possible. Also, this surge will break the floating sludge, so that make the sludge uh, set us better for, for better um, performance. I mean, but again, this, all these are based on um, small scale reactor without a full scale uh, application. I have a little question, but um, I, I wanted to, before, I, I just want to check if any of the other experts maybe want yeah, to ask please. Jian Min before I say something else, because really you guys are the biogas experts. And is anyone, Tony or Gabrielle or Temeskin? Wait, hang on, Tony, you're muted. Yeah, I'm Tony, you look like you're muted. Phone. You need oh, to yeah, now? unmute. Now is okay, yeah. I can't, I can't hear you. The curiosity is that here in Europe, we have several mixing mechanisms for dry anaerobic digestion that are based on biogas recirculation. This is the case of Dranco or other co companies. Is it that similar or not? No, it, it's a mutant. Dranco, for instance, they, Balorga, they use uh, recycling which, of which biogas. Company? to help in mixing a dry anaerobic digestion that is typical with municipal solid waste. Is a similar system for a small scale anaerobic digesters or is completely different? Uh, No, I, I, I do not know the system you, you talk about. There's another system called uh, uh, Oren, Oreno or some system. They use uh, um, the uh, um, mixing system. However, their system is uh, they have to recycle the biogas to the bottom and have this biogas to generate a large bubble to a riser. But uh, our system, we build the uh, the collection, the gas collection, in the middle of the tank, so that uh, it will collect the biogas itself rather than rely on the return. Uh, but uh, if you want, if you really want to return the biogas, that's okay. We we can also do that. You just add another return line to increase the frequency. But if you get the biogas reactor high enough, yeah, like uh, Gabriel, eight feet high, for example, uh, I don't think you need the the, the biogas return. Uh, sorry, I just wasn't sure. What was the increase in biogas production within your system compared to a control? How much more gas did you get from the reactor? 30%. Oh, we got the... Uh, Sorry, how many? We got 30% more. 30%, okay. Sure. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thirty. 30%. Thanks a lot, uh, Jamie. That was a yeah. really... We hope we can get them all, but just a big um, smaller so size of the reactor. The we, slide here that, that's that, about the limit. Uh, yeah. American Geroma. So it's... Uh, you're you're uh, up... We've got two papers left, Tamezgin's paper and uh, Gabrielle's. Um, and Tamezgin, you're going to tell us about the uh, enhanced standard. I believe enhanced, I have. Uh, anaerobic digestion, a adaptation and energy recovery technology, the MODAD uh, process. Uh, there are some slides here. So I will, um, I will find those here. <coughs> So, away we go. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, good. So, um, I'll be briefly talking about the uh, MODAD process. It is a, a resource recovery oriented sanitation technology. Uh, it, it was developed with the, you know, the funding we got from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So can we go to the next slide? Uh, 
so I mean this is the facts I think all of you guys know it but I think uh, stating it is not a bad idea so about 2.5 billion people mostly living in developing countries they do lack access to basic sanitation I think that's the fact and uh, in fact that is what you know makes this uh, discussion important and uh, as a result about 3.5 four million people, mostly children, are dying every year from diseases uh, contracted through direct or indirect uh, contact with human feces. So now what is the main reason for the low sanitation coverage in developing countries? To me, uh, the following two are the most important ones. One is the lack of affordable sanitation technologies. I think the key word here is affordable. Other than that, you know, uh, you know, very well tested, proven waste treatment technologies have, have been used in the developed countries. So, if they were affordable, then this discussion is not important. The next thing is the lack of skilled personnel and the technical capacity in those countries. You can mention other factors such as social, cultural, hygienic behavior and the perception of uh, the community for sanitation could be uh, contributing factors. But to me, the two criti critical ones are the lack of affordable sanitation technology and the lack of skilled personnel or technical capacity. Can we go to the next slide? So, when we think about the next generation of sanitation technologies, to address this challenge, we should think of about the following. I think they should satisfy the following criteria. It should be reliable, uh, inexpensive, and sustainable. In addition, some of uh, the next ones are actually embedded in the sustainability and expensiveness uh, of the process. For example, they should be built from locally available resources. We should not import expertise as well as resources from you know the developing countries and also they should be operated and managed by individuals with a minimal training minimal training and I also think they should not require complex modern equipments that you know if we have to monitor them then it goes increases the cost next so with that in mind, uh, you know, the title has changed since I submitted uh, the grant and we got the grant. At that time, the title says enhance. Uh, but now we're saying we need, it is a modified anaerobic digestion process. So what we were proposing is an enhancement to an existing technology. Anaerobic digestion has been used uh, for over, you know, for several decades. So the idea is to enhance, modify, and adapt the process in developing countries. In order to do that, I think we need to create an incentive for the community. In this case, we're saying we need to generate a reliable supply of biogas from the co-digestion of algal biomass and waste. Uh, that means human waste. At the same time, we should recover nutrients in the form of biosolid. That means in addition to getting the sanitation, if we provide them additional incentive, then the community can adapt and self-sustain the technology. Next. So uh, I don't have any uh, you know, results to show you, but this is what we got. Uh, we have achieved the desired degree of waste treatment under varying operational conditions. We have changed the temperature. We have changed alkalinity, which is a critical parameter. We have looked at the pH, change in pH, uh, organic loading, uh, and uh, detention time, because it is uh, critical. We need to achieve the uh, required degree of treatment. So based on that, this is some of the advantages of the technology. It can be built from locally available materials, such as brick, stone, and so on. Uh, does not require chemical addition to adjust pH, for example, or to adjust alkalinity. It works at ambient temperature, 
we have tested uh, you know the system for over a year actually close to a year at 10 degrees centigrade it works fine and another advantage is it can be used to collect contain and treat waste in the same reactor especially this is important uh, if we consider you know rural areas or urban areas where there is no sewer connection again it can be scaled to treat waste at any facility a single household to a city block so based on that I believe uh, the MODA technology has a potential to be developed into a reliable affordable sanitation technology can we go to the next slide so what are our plans for full-scale implementation uh, we just completed you know the test on the lab scale uh, right now we are doing some analysis of the data uh, so our plan is to field test the technology and uh, currently we are seeking funding to do the field test in Kenya and Ethiopia as far as the operation is concerned uh, for example if it is adapted at household level we think that you know the end users will be responsible for the capital operation and the maintenance cost maybe you know depending on the uh, government of some country they could provide them with as an incentive for example the construction cost the capital cost uh, even though some think that you know subsidizing development or something sanitation type of a project has a drawback saying you know people will be dependent on the external source rather than taking it as their own project at public places it could be a public uh, energy or private partnership type of uh, you know adoption maybe a private sector adoption so we're thinking of for example the uh, real estate companies they might provide this technology as a package with you know whatever real estate development they are doing maybe micro and a small enterprise you know there are many people who don't have a job in developing countries the young and so on if they are properly trained and uh, if they can generate income from this uh, they might take it you know uh, as their own so we we do think at public places for example the technology can self-sustain with the revenues which will be generated from per use fees as well as sale of biogas and uh, residual biosolids <clears throat> next so yeah uh, you know we have a website for the project uh, we are planning to post future updates and additional information at the website which is moda.sdsu.edu it's up running and uh, also you can email us with any question on moda.sdsu.edu okay thank you so much for that Again, it, anybody have any questions um, regarding uh, this uh, potential technology? We didn't have any results to show us, but um, the ideas are put on the table. Um, any hands up for that? Uh, Gabriel, away you go. Yes. Um, hi, Denzel. Thank you for your presentation. I just had some questions about the degree of treatment that you spoke about. Um, you're talking about reusing the waste resources, and I was wondering what level of what what indicators you are using to test the suitability of the waste treatment, and also what your intended use was for the waste as well. Okay, uh, those are good questions. The WHO specifies that you know any uh, residual biosolid to be used for land application has to meet about uh, two million coliform units per gram of solids. So you have to achieve that before you apply to land. So in our case. In fact, at uh, mm -hmm. you know 35 degrees centigrade, which is the uh, optimal 
called anaerobic digestion, you can achieve that uh, in about 30 days or 60 days. But the issue comes when the uh, temperature falls below that because this is, you know, a rate, uh, the rate is dependent on temperature. That's why at 10 degrees centigrade, we did run the experiment for almost a year. Mm -hmm. And at 20 degrees centigrade, we ran it for six months. So in six months, actually, it, it fall below the two million, as well as for uh, 10 degrees centigrade at, uh, you know, for a year. And uh, so the biosol, the biosol is could be okay. used for land application. I mean, it is rich in nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus. Uh, whereas the biogas, you know, it could be used for so many purposes. Mm. Cooking, lighting, and so on. Okay, any other questions? Who was Miss yeah. Elizabeth? There you go. Yes. You, Gabrielle. Actually, Gabrielle wanted another one? Mm. Or should I go first? No. Okay, um... Just about the reuse, I'm not sure about this figure, this 2 million coliform, but it reminded me on the forum we had a discussion about uh, there's some guidelines in China where they have ample experience with using this digestate as fertilizer and Heinz-Peter Mang put some interesting, um, interesting presentation up. So I could send that link around afterwards because I think that it might help with Gabrielle's question and may be interesting for Temeskin too. But my my question is, I still don't really get the the main the main difference is just that you're feeding algae into the process. That's that's pretty much the main thing. Or is there other okay. differences as well to the conventional? So I think the 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 uh, the main interest of the research is to generate a sustainable a sustained production of biogas. Now, if you hundred percent rely on human waste. In human waste, yes, it has some biogas, some VSS, but it is very uh, little. Uh, about 90 gram of COD per day. An average person produces about 90 gram of COD per day. If you look at the energy content of that one, it is about 50, uh, 50 liters per day. Okay, if you do it at optimal temperature of 35 degrees centigrade. But the issue is, if you want to adopt the technology, let us say at the household level, a single household needs about a uh, about uh, 1,000 liters of biogas for cooking and lighting purpose on average. This is, uh, I think, produced by GTZ a couple of years back. Now, if in one household we assume there are five people on average, then you would be getting about only 250. So it is not enough for that household to maintain this system. Then we say, how about if we add algae? Why did we choose algae? The main reason is if you go to developing countries, algae actually creates a lot of issues. Rano from uh, agriculture creates you know, lakes and rivers blanketed with algae. So just they can collect that and dump into the reactor still get the biogas production. In addition, even though that was our goal initially, we found out some interesting thing about algae during the experiment. Adding algae, uh, there are proteins in algae. Algae contains carbohydrates, protein, and lipids. Now, the protein, when it's broken down, it goes to a modification process. And a modification actually adds alkalinity. That's why I'm saying we don't need to add any chemicals. When you add alkalinity, it helps us a buffering for a pH change. So in many countries, you know, anaerobic digestion has been used. And what happens is if it's not properly maintained, it fails. The main reason for most of the failures is the way you feed the organic. If, let us say, you are feeding the organic, it goes through hydrolysis then acidogenesis and the methanogenesis. So these are two different group of bacteria doing that. And their growth rate is totally different. That means if you add too much organic, it is hydrolyzed 
and it becomes uh, uh, by acidogenesis change it to acids. But the metagenes, they are very slow. And if they don't convert that, the acid accumulates, the whole system collapses. But if you have sufficient alkalinity for a buffering, it will help you. So in our case, we were surprised to find out the alkalinity increased drastically. And the main reason is actually the algae. And it, that means it, it controls the whole system. Now you might say, OK, some countries, they don't have the algae. Now, actually, what we are thinking of testing in the field test is household waste, which contains protein, should serve again as a source of alkalinity. Okay, that's fantastic. Um, we're learning a lot from you this afternoon. Uh, Kim or uh, Nelson, you had, you had a question. Yeah, I had a question on, on the algae as so, well. Uh, how much do you think you have to add when it comes to algae on a household also level, and uh, what kind of uh, algae plants are you talking talking about? Okay, so we tested uh, one type of algae. It is Colora vulgaris species. Uh, we haven't tested, you know, any wild algae, but as far as I'm concerned, it you know, typical algae they do contain this uh, component: the carbohydrate, the lipid, and the protein in a different proportion. So as long as they contain some percentage of the protein, which is an important one as far as alkalinity is concerned, it should be okay. Now, you said how much? How much is a critical? So what we did is in our experiment, we varied the organic load. So the organic load, some is coming from tick and activated sludge, TWAS, the other is coming from algae. So we varied the proportion. We run different experiments. In one, we have 100% of TWAS. In another, we add about 90% TWAS, 10% of algae. And then the next one, about 80% of TWAS, 20% of algae. And then finally, we had 100% algae, 0% TWAS. And what we found out is pretty much in all cases, they are producing the same amount of biogas. That tells me, actually, algae is a good supplement as a source of biomass. So you can add, you know, 50-50% uh, or even whatever percentage. But still, it gives you the uh, an increase in biogas production. So it depends on how much they have on the source. But adding a minimum of 20% is important in order to get, you know, the alkalinity uh, you need. One of the purposes of using algae is that you're cleaning the wastewater at the same time. Because you, one could just be adding farm wastes, uh, food wastes, uh, any kind of organic material. Yes, Gabriel, you have the last question before we move to your paper. I have a question. Uh, Gabriel, have Gabriel you have to turn your mic on. I just did. Okay. Hey. Thing is, if you have... Ah, thank you. Okay, if you have this... Ah, we've got to okay. speaking at the same time. Who is... Hi. Take Gabriel's question. Okay. Yes. I'll wait. So, okay. Ah. Uh, I was just wondering if the alkalinity is acting as a buffer, what pH are you operating at or aiming to operate at? Okay, typically an, uh, anaerobic digestion systems work in the pH range of 6.5 to 7.5. So I think the alkalinity, it helps you for the pH node to change. Okay, so whatever initial pH you start with, which typically household wastes are in that pH range, the alkalinity will help you if you have any accumulation of, you know, acid in the system. Okay, Tony, a question. Yeah. Okay. Sure. A short question. We had to test some algae for biogas production, but they were algae used for 
hydrogen and biodiesel production. And we have a lot of problems with the salt content salt. of algae. In your case, have, have you seen some problem related to salt? Uh, no, I think we, we, we know we grew the algae in the lab. So in, uh, I mean, I mean, this is, you know, uh, the project actually initially I'm working with algae on those areas on lipid extraction for uh, biodiesel and uh, ethanol production from the carbohydrates. But when I saw the uh, call for proposal, I said, you know, I think the critical thing here is we need to make sure there is an incentive for the community to adapt any technology. I have thought about it. Uh, the technology has to be simple. Is there anything simpler than anaerobic digestion? Mm, no. Then, but the gas production is too low. There is no incentive for them. Then I said, I need to have some source of biomass. Uh, then algae has, you know, the, the best biomass out there. Then I said, why don't we test this? It, it, it worked. So we haven't seen any issue with the uh, salt content. Maybe, you know, if it's coming from the marine environment, that could be an issue. But this is something we have grown in lab. And again, uh, what I'm thinking in the developing countries, it's not from, mostly from rivers and the lakes. So they may not have that high okay, salt content. Okay, I'm going to uh, stop that uh, fantastic discussion. Uh, we could go keep going. On. But we're going to go to... Uh, Gabriel's paper, and she's actually uh, in Phnom Penh this evening, so she, I'm not sure what time it is. It's rather late. We'll give you a chance to um, give you a chance to give your paper, and we we'll tie things up here. I'll just get your uh, PowerPoint here, and away you go, Gabriel. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for this opportunity to present on the work that we've been doing here in Cambodia. Uh, I guess the aim of our project also is very similar to what you were talking about, Smetskin. Uh, so I'm based in an NGO that's in Phnom Penh. Uh, it's called Live and Learn Environmental Education. And uh, we've been working for a long time with the communities on the Tono Sap Lake in Cambodia. Uh, so there's around 1.6 million people who live on and around the Tono Sap Lake. And these, many of these people are in floating communities. Uh, so their whole houses, their houses and all of the community is based on the lake. And so they have problems with sanitation. Uh, there is not very many suitable sanitation solutions for them. Um, and so this is where that project's come from. And like Tamezkin said, uh, we were looking for a way to make incentives from, from the sanitation solutions so it could be ongoing. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, so I guess the work that we've been doing under this project is twofold. Uh, this is, photo here is from a test site that we set up in Phnom Penh with one of the local universities. It's the Royal University of Agriculture, Phnom Penh, it's the Department of Fisheries. Um, and these are some of the prototype uh, biodigesters that we've been making for these communities. Um, as you can see, they're all in the water and the aim is that they float. The systems are designed to be household scale systems. Uh, so we don't have already treated waste. It's actually raw human waste that goes into the systems. Um, so we have two different prototypes here. The one towards the back of the photo, which have the red and white stripes uh, made from a plastic that's cheaper. Um, so all of these are lo local, locally available materials in Cambodia, uh, but these systems at the back are a cheaper system, but perhaps not as durable. But it might make it easier for uh, someone who wants to buy a biodigester system to purchase, because uh, there's not the same high capital outlay. 
Um, and then the systems towards the front of the photo, which look like large water tanks, which is what they use for often. Uh, I guess cost a little bit more, but perhaps will last a little bit longer. And also a more aesthetically pleasing, which is very important for the community as well. Um, so these, both these prototypes are designed to have about a 30-day retention time uh, for the waste treatment that we we're aiming to achieve. Um, we haven't looked at that exact number that you were talking about, Timezkin, with the two million coliforms per one gram of solid, because we often we get a liquid waste out, but that's good to know. That's something that we'll look into. Um, so these systems, we've I guess been also undertaking similar experiments in trying to understand the varying amounts, uh, the varying conditions or that these systems can work under. So we've been feeding these systems with pig waste, uh, which is another problem on the Tonle Sap Lake is there's lots of floating pig farms on there and these, these pigs also, their waste also goes into the lake. Um, so the idea is that, that that waste could be used as a biomass supplement into the biodigesters. Uh, so we've been trying different combinations of pig waste and human waste and there's a weed uh, that's a water hyacinth which is on found on the Tonle Sap Lake which is a noxious weed. Um, and so we've also been chopping that up and trying to use that as another source of biomass. And so these biodigesters have been looking at those different feeds. Um, one, of, one, one of the things we've been studying is the different feeds and the results of the differences in gas production and waste, sorry, and pathogen treatment. We've also been looking at different retention times to see um, if that what impact that has if a larger system relates to a similarly large uh, increase in gas production and then also been looking at the different prototypes to see if they resulted in different systems as well, uh, different, sorry, gas productions and pathogen treatment. Um, I do have some results for those but three slides wasn't enough to put them all in. Um, and so I guess an aspect of our work that might be a little bit different from some of the experiences you have all had is uh, we've been, uh, throughout our testing, we've been involved with the community the whole time. So we've been putting systems in the community and receiving some of their feedback about how the system looks or works or minor, minor problems that they have with it and how they can operate it. Um, and so on the left-hand side, we have a photo of some of the staff from Live and Learn Environmental Education who are installing a biodigester in the community. Um, so we have about 30 systems available out in the community at the moment. This one isn't floating, but the area that it's part of is flood affected, um, which means for some part of the year that system will be semi-submerged. Um, so that was another, that's another one of the communities we've been working with, communities who are affected seasonally by excessive water. Um, so we've been training, we, after we put the systems in and we, we being live and learn, environmental education, had a good handle on how they worked and operated and what were some, some common, not problems, but things that needed to be tweaked. Um, we ran training sessions for, we run training sessions for uh, the local community, so the local community knows how to fix the biodigesters if there's any problems that arise. Um, usually they're small things or that the idea is that they understand how the biodigesters come together and how they work and what uh, materials can be used to fix them or to replace parts. Um, and so that's been a, a more recent part of the work that we've been doing and, and ensuring that the community is able to maintain these systems by themselves. Um, and the photo on the right hand side is uh, one of the community members who has been using the biodigester now. And so this is a, a floating system as you can see that's the Tonle Sap Lake there. Um, so these houses will be submerged or they're floating and these pig farms just, just to the right behind him. Um, I just sort of wanted to you know, put a face to the work that we've been doing there. Um, and so these systems, the community members that we have, uh, many of them are able to
it seems like the community members are really mainly interested in it for the cooking purposes. Um, yeah, so that's, question, that's all from Live and Learn, but I'd be happy to answer questions. That's coming out of this digester on the right side. And how, is this a floating um, house as well? Yes, this is the one on the right hand side is a floating house. Uh, that hose, it depends on the setup of the house. Uh, so often we don't connect the biodigesters to the house directly. They're sort of, you know, loosely attached with the rope so it doesn't float away. Um, so the hose is basically as long as the distance is from the biodigester to the reservoir. So we have a separate reservoir as well for these systems, which is a plastic reservoir that, the, again, is cheap. Um, generally, the hose doesn't have, that looks like it's not quite being connected yet, actually. It looks like there's a lot of excessive hose there. It's generally a little bit more taut than that. What sort of quality of methane production do we get? Um, we haven't done a lot of tests on the quality of the methane production, but there is a large uh, uh, there's a large program in Cambodia where we are working for the National Biodigester Program, and they've designed small sulfur systems for the removal, and we often put them in the gas hose out the, so from the reservoir before the cook stove. There's a small sort of sulfur removal system that we put in there. Uh, you're going to have to put your mic on. Sure. Yeah, this question goes to all of you. Uh, I want to raise the question of costs, costs and sustainability of each of your systems. Your systems vary from high tech to low tech uh, systems. I would, uh, can, I'd like you to say something about the cost of the capital expenditure for construction of a unit. And also, if you have plans of involving entrepreneurs, uh, what are those plans? Okay, that's a lot uh, to bite off. I'm not sure if all, all of you can answer that question, but if any one of you have data on costs uh, right off the bat, uh, it would be good to hear. Jan Min has, has left his chair, so he's not going to... Oh, he came back. Okay. Uh. I have some preliminary data on that. Um, if that's okay for me to answer. Uh, we've had a look at some of the size of these systems. Uh, so, as I mentioned before, we have the two systems, and we've been looking, focusing more on the tank that's shown in these photos here. Uh, the smaller system we have is a, can be produced for around two hundred dollars, and even using very rough estimates for sort of the gas, what the gas is worth, you, the systems look to pay themselves back in about two years. Uh, so $200 is a lot for a Cambodian family, um, but that's not to say it's unattainable. But as I mentioned before, then there is a national biodigester program that has subsidies available. Um, and so we're looking to partner with them in the next phase. and hoping that they have a system that involves lots of entrepreneurs across Cambodia. And so we're looking to partner with them and our biodigesters would form yeah, sort of one of the many products that they're able to offer to the different communities. Yeah, um, thanks. Um, I just have one question on safety aspects. Um, I think on the forum some people discussed also, like there's Mughal from Pakistan, he's always very strong on saying, uh, you know, remember it could explode and so on. Um, so when I see this, which looks pretty much handmade, and I'm, I'm just a little bit worried, is there any chance that you could suddenly have an explosion there of, of the biogas? And then my second question is, the idea was also to bring these grantees a bit closer together, so I was just wondering whether the algae, whether this could be interesting for you to try out to add algae, or would you say you've anyway got more than enough biogas from all your pigments? Um, 
I guess it would be would be an interesting system to try with algae. Uh, if the, I, I guess not that it's the same, but uh, we've employed a similar idea that there's uh, this water hyacinth, which is a noxious weed on the lake that we've been trying to that we thought would be could be used as um, as another biomass supplement. Um, I, we have, I don't know much about the algae situation in Cambodia, but um, definitely something that could be worth exploring um, because I'm sure that there's people out there who would want more gas if it was available to them. Um, in regards to the safety question, um, yes, it does look handmade. It is handmade. Um, uh, there is some, is some issues surrounding safety and I guess Cambodians live with a different element, different element of risk in their lives than from what I would normally expect. But we try to include things in the design, such as safety bottles. The system operates at a lower pressure. We ensure that the reservoir is further away from the flames and fairly well protected. And the system's designed that uh, the sludge should pass out should pass out of the biodigester before allow the sludge should fall should be pushed out of the outlet rather than allowing a gas build up inside the tank. But it is something that we're always looking to improve on. But again, I guess there's the trade off with the cost and uh, as I said, the, there's a different level of acceptable risk in Cambodia. That answer your question. <laughs> Any mix? Uh, yeah, because I'm working on the mixing, so I, I, I don't want to ask you to have any no, inside. No, we don't, we don't have any mixing inside, which is why I was asking you how much more gas you get. <laughs> um, I guess we, in the interest of designing a very low-tech system, uh, it just relies on the new waste being added every day and that providing some small amount of mixing. I guess the waves could help with a little bit of mixing too. Absolutely. So I think we're going to round out here. Um, if there's uh, no further questions, uh, we we have been speaking almost sure. uh, a little over an hour now with with these uh, four uh, very interesting research projects uh, funded by the Gates Foundation. And through an assignment, uh, we have been given the privilege to uh, put these is to you uh, uh, over the internet and through the Susanna Forum where these projects, as well as many of the other ones, are being discussed. Um, you've heard today uh, a little bit about um, iron nanoparticles and self-mixing, addition of algae, and the floating digesters. Uh, four different projects, but they all have something in common. They produce uh, biogas. And biogas is interesting. It pays for itself. It's, uh, it's not any uh, fuel. It, it, it's actually competing with um, with oil-based systems. So it's uh, big stuff, and it has great potential for changing the world. Um, so on, uh, uh, on behalf of uh, the Susanna Forum and the Stockholm Environment Institute, I'd like to thank you, all four of you, for, for spending this hour with us. And um, we congratulate you on the research that you've done. And we hope to hear from you on the Susanna Forum in the near future. So we say good evening or good morning, depending on where you are. Bye-bye. Okay,